everyone, and good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the Policy Resolution Group's post-election analysis, where in one hour, we're going to attempt to unpack the implications of the elections on key issues ranging from energy and environment to consumer products and manufacturing, and really just a whole lot more. For those of you who don't know, PRG is the Government Relations and Strategic Communications Practice at Bracewell. I'm Dee Martin, and I am the co-head of the Policy Resolution Group, along with my good friend and colleague, Scott Siegel, who I'm going to turn to in just one second after I tell you that. Number one, this event is being recorded. We will circulate a link to you uh, later today. The audio is also going to be available on the Lobby Shop podcast. Uh, that is PRG's podcast. If you haven't tuned in before, now is a great time to start. I highly recommend it. We are taking questions. You can type in questions, and we're going to try to answer them as we go. This is very fast-paced. We may not get to them at the time, but we'll try to pick them up at the end if we don't. You can always email or call any of us. All of our information is available at bracewell.com. Finally, be on the lookout for written materials and analysis that provide a deeper dive into many of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. That's going to arrive in your email inbox sometime later this week. So if we're ready, we're going to jump in. Scott Siegel, good morning. Um, Scott, you are a 30-year political veteran and a highly uh, respected professional in the energy and environmental space. Can you set the stage for us today? What has happened? What is happening? And you have five minutes to do it. And we're going to come back to you later in the show. Okay. Well, let me, I'm going to tell you, uh, wow, what a night. I think for those of you who are follow this for a living, or, uh, or manage risk for corporations or trade associations or just for political junkies. You've really never seen anything like you saw uh, quite like last night. Uh, and it's not our job here to recreate everything you could have heard in the media. Uh, we, we hopefully will uh, give you, uh, as, as this uh, presentation uh, moves on, some hot takes, uh, and we'll, have, we'll bring to bear some interesting guests from outside of the PRG family that bring some unique expertise for everybody to listen to. So uh, as you may have heard, it takes 270 electoral votes in the, in the Electoral College in order to become President of the United States. And as you may also have heard, based on those states that were called last night, uh, there are not 270 votes for either uh, former Vice President Joe Biden or for President Trump. In fact, uh, uh, AP's latest uh, calling of, uh, of these uh, races puts it at Biden at 238 and Trump at 213. Um, so there is an increasingly smaller number of states that present in order to, uh, to choose the next president uh, and, and get off of, of high center and get to 270. With the victory in Arizona, uh, uh, Vice President Biden, um, even without winning the state of Pennsylvania, if he, if he should fail to win the state of Pennsylvania, would reach the necessary 270 votes if he can win Michigan and Wisconsin and hang on in the state of Nevada. And, uh, of course, he's up by 8,000 in Nevada, and in, in the uh, votes that have been counted thus far, uh, you know, he, he seems to be ahead in Michigan and Wisconsin. And what that tells us is not that he is a lock to win. We won't know that until at the earliest later today when some states may call or, or as time goes on, at a, at a later point, uh, if, uh, if things get drawn out as much as possible. But uh, I would point the, uh, make the following observation. President Trump needs to win four of the following states to pass that 270 threshold. Georgia, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. He won them all in 2016, but he's not going to win them all this time. So if Biden wins any two of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, he'll win. And as we said, uh, the, the data seems to indicate that he's ahead in Pennsylvania, and, uh, or ahead rather in Michigan and Wisconsin. And I would also observe that the remaining votes left to be counted are all mail-in ballots, which Democrats have, have had a pretty much of a comfortable two-to-one lead uh, in mail-in ballots. I, weirdly, this year, whether you use the Postal Service or show up in your high school gymnasium is a political question. So, uh, so uh, yeah, those are, are, are more likely to favor uh, Democrats. Here's some key takeaways from last night. Uh, I would say, um, uh, first of all, 100 million people voted uh, early. And they probably like that because it's easier. And so if we're going to keep doing that, then states need to update their election laws so we're able to process those votes, not count them, but process them in advance of Election Day. 
Secondly, uh, suburban women did not completely turn on Donald Trump, and that's shown up in some of the excerpt data in particular. Uh, thirdly, Latino voters are not monolithic, and you can break that down comparing Arizona to South Florida, and, and you can meet each own conclusion. Next, polling data still does not capture the energy of Trump voters, particularly in rural areas and in the exurbs. Uh, these are the things that I, I took away, at least from the election last night. There are many other lessons probably you can take away from it, but that, uh, that seems uh, productive to me. So as of 11.45 last night, it was clear that the Democrats had retained the House of Representatives. The only thing I would say there is we had some, there were some key losses in the House of Representatives that are still interesting to us, New Mexico and South Carolina. Uh, but many, many of you in the energy sector were probably watching Kendra Horn in Oklahoma, who, who conceded as well, Donna Shalala in Florida, uh, and, and others. So I, so I think that's interesting. Colin Peterson, somebody many of you may have worked with as uh, in his various chairmanship roles, uh, also lost by a pretty good margin. And those of you who work on infrastructure were probably interested in what would happen with uh, Chairman DeFazio in Oregon. And he did win re-election over uh, the uh, uh, Paris train hero and Dancing with the Stars saw uh, Alex uh, Stilatos. Uh, the Democrats thought they would take more seats, uh, maybe in Texas, maybe in Missouri, uh, but those, those states are not uh, materializing as they might say in place. Let's turn to the Senate. Uh, that's really uh, very important here. And in our, our judgment, it seems most likely that the Senate will re remain in the hands of the Republicans. So we're going to have that. So if this trend data of lately counted ballots occurs and Biden actually does uh, hold on to end the presidency, we're going to absolutely have divided government, uh, most likely have divided government in terms of what's going on in the Senate. Our Senate stalwarts did win re-election. Folks like John Cornyn, who many of you I know uh, have worked with, uh, Mitch McConnell, of course, um, and, uh, and even Lindsey Graham didn't have as close of a race as people thought they would, uh, uh, thought he would. Um, if, uh, so there's a lot of minutia here. There are possible pathways for a flip, but it would take a lot of things. Uh, basically, it would take uh, of four remaining scenarios, including two runoffs in the state of Georgia, it would take the Democrats winning three of those four scenarios. And we all are sort of the conclusion that while that's possible, it's just not likely. So let's assume for a moment that Biden does put it together. Let's uh, do, let's do a, a top-level take before I relinquish. I don't know where I am in my five minutes, but I'm probably okay. So let's do a sort of a top-level take, uh, take here. Um, we will never have elected a president with this much practical experience with the U.S. Senate. So assuming for a moment that the Senate is in a different, is in a, uh, has different leadership than the White House, this is somebody who will literally bring four decades of experience in dealing with the Senate, Friendships in the U.S. Senate, nobody since LBJ really has had that kind of uh, look at it. And we would usefully describe Biden as an institutionalist, somebody who believes the Senate, if properly motivated, can work. That's very important because the opportunities to eliminate the filibuster, for example, or even to use the reconciliation process on the budget side uh, are effectively off the table if you don't control Senate leadership. So the ability to actually jawbone in the Senate and create a middle path for passage of legislation is more important. And, and I, I'm not trying to lionize Joe Biden here, but I will tell you there are few people that would fit that bill. In fact, we have some alumni of the uh, Obama administration that we're going to talk to a little bit later, and I, I suspect they would agree that Biden, as a person to be dispatched to the Senate, was particularly effective. Uh, so on the major issues, tax packages, energy, uh, climate change, we will see more modest attempts, in my judgment, at negotiated compromises, because that's what an institutionalist like Joe Biden knows that's all he can get. And I would stress here that Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell may have been gladiators against one another, both in the Senate and in this election season, but they know each other very well, and if we, uh, they probably consider each other to be friends. So the opportunity to work across that aisle absolutely could work. Now, obviously, if, uh, if, if, the, um, if the president wins, if President Trump ends up at the end of the day uh, squeaking out a victory, um, you know, I, I, our suspicion is we'll see more of the same in a second term, but we'll explicitly in a, in a little bit uh, 
And the last item I, I, I takeaway I want to make is assuming that President Trump does end up losing in a squeaker, like in a real squeaker, and it'll be a squeaker. It won't be the blue wave that a lot of people talked about. To my Texans on the call, and I bet there's a hundred of you on the call, but the blue mirage did not appear in the state of Texas, as many of us were predicting that it would not. So, you know, the question I have for you, though, is in that lame duck period, that period between of the election day and inauguration of a new administration, what's that going to be like? And all I can tell you is this. It's going to depend very much on what is in the head of Donald J. Trump. Because if he decides that he uh, was a victim of fraud, if he decides that he will pursue any one of a number of litigation strategies, if he decides that he's just sick and tired of the United States federal government because of its many injustices that it's uh, visited upon him, he may decide to do literally nothing during the lame duck, and that could result in governmental shutdowns, a failure to pass a continuing resolution to keep the government open. On the other hand, if he views that lame duck period as the time to, to put the coda on, a, uh, on his uh, reputation moving forward, it could, be, it could be a productive session. In fact, Republican leaders might be motivated to make it somewhat productive before they face the vicissitudes of a Democratic White House. So that's it. That's my hot take. That's what happened last night. Uh, you could know the outcome as soon as this evening. Or the far end would have to be the Supreme Court's ruling regarding North Carolina, which is nine days from Election Day, which is the amount of time North Carolina has to count any ballot that was postmarked by uh, Election Day. But, uh, but we don't think it's going to take them nine days to be able to call North Carolina. So that's, but that's your time range. Uh, but uh, uh, but that's, that's our overview takes and where we are right now. So uh, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant analysis as always. And I will say among the most concise presentations I've ever seen you make. Thank yeah. you. Let's keep moving, though. We'll be back to Scott in a little bit with a very special guest, uh, Ron Mintz. But before we get there, I want to go to some of our other PRG colleagues for what we're calling hot takes uh, on issue areas that we know are important to all of you. I'm going to start with um, shakeups in key um, committees of, jurisdi of jurisdiction, congressional committees of jurisdiction. I'm going to start with John Lee and Anna Burha. Anna, uh, nearly a decade in the Senate on the Environment and Public Works Committee, a key committee for many of the folks uh, participating in today's call. Give us your hot take of the ultimate leadership that we'll eventually see in the Senate. Uh, we do have a musical chairs of sorts playing out in the upper chamber. So per Republican rules, Energy and Natural Resources Committee Chair Lisa Murkowski is termed out. So she will relinquish her gavel uh, at the end of this year and likely focus on her leadership of the Appropriations Interior and Environment Subcommittee. Murkowski's departure from the top Republican stop, sorry, the top Republican spot, uh, say that three times fast, at ENR means that John Barrasso is going to likely give up his gavel at the Environment and Public Works Committee uh, so that he can go over to ENR. Barrasso's move actually presents um, an historic opportunity for the GOP at EPW. Shelley Moore Capito from West Virginia uh, is poised to step up to become the first female Republican to lead EPW and the second woman ever following California Democrat Barbara Boxer. Uh, so in Capito's first Senate term, she chaired two of the biggest subcommittees at EPW, Clean Air and Nuclear Safety and Transportation Infrastructure. So she's known for being level-headed and dedicated which bodes well for the productivity of the committee. Uh, since Senate Democrats don't impose term limits on their committee leaders, Tom Carper of Delaware is going to remain as the top Democrat at EPW, uh, and Joe Manchin from West Virginia will be top Democrat in ENR. So West Virginia will be in leadership roles for the two energy and environment committees in the Senate. 
That's great. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Great analysis. Now let's go to John Lee, fresh back from North Carolina. Uh, John, what's your hot take on key committees of jurisdiction? Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, as we turn to the House, um, as of this week, Pelosi and the House Democratic leadership were preparing for an expand, expanded majority. And instead, what we're looking at is many of the 2018 frontline members are headed for the exit. So what does a smaller mandate mean uh, for agenda setting and specifically for committee leadership? Uh, we're looking at two committees in particular. The first would be the House Appropriations Committee with Chairwoman Nita Lowy uh, retiring this year. There's three declared candidates, uh, Marcy Kaptur from the state of Ohio, hold seniority um, and is, is seen to be the front runner uh, for the uh, chairwoman slot. Rosa DeLauro is also declared. Uh, she currently chairs the Labor and Human Health and Services Subcommittee, which is the largest subcommittee after the Defense Subcommittee. And then Debbie Wasserman Schultz uh, also declared. She has the support of many key CDC members, Congressional Black Caucus members, and has made social justice a priority of her campaign for the chairwoman slot. Uh, and no matter who gets named chairwoman, uh, this will start a subcommittee shuffle amongst the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and remember, against all of this is the backdrop of a December 11th deadline uh, to fund the government uh, for fiscal year 2021. So this is something that the Appropriations Committee is going to have to work through during the lame duck, lame duck session. Uh, turning to the R Republican side of the ledger, the, the second committee we have our eyes on is the Energy and Commerce Committee, and specifically the ranking member slots. There are also three declared uh, candidates for, for the ranking member role. Uh, the first being uh, uh, Representative Burgess from Texas, who currently chairs the Health Subcommittee and does hold seniority. Um, other candidates include Kathy McMorris Rogers, who uh, is the ranking member for the uh, Consumer Protection Subcommittee. And lastly, we have uh, Bob Lada from the state of Ohio, who uh, works on communications and, and telecom issues. So. Out of those three candidates, what's interesting is we've heard that uh, from Leader McCarthy that they are going to try to prioritize um, placing more women in Republican leadership roles, so that that would tell us that perhaps Kathy McMorris Rogers will get more consideration, but look for Burgess and Lada to be competitive candidates. And last but not least, Scott mentioned the necessity of navigating a Republican Senate. And I think if, if you're watching the Energy and Commerce Committee, keep an eye on Paul Tonko. He is uh, going to be chairing the Environment Subcommittee and will, will play a key uh, negotiator role uh, with Republican Senate in terms of what can actually move on energy and environmental policy. Dee, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, John. We're going to turn now to hot takes in the energy and environmental space. Uh, at the agency level, I'm going to turn to Christine Wyman, who is an environmental and policy attorney here at Bracewell. Christine, what's your hot take on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? I think no matter who is in the White House, FERC is going to continue to play a, a big role in the nexus of energy and climate policy that it, that it uh, has played in the past. So currently we have three sitting FERC commissioners, two Republican and one Democrat. This is out of the possible five commissioners. President Trump, over the summer, nominated two new FERC commissioners, one Republican and one Democrat. They await a full vote by the Senate, which could happen before the end of this Congress. So if Biden wins, he's likely to inherit a 3-2 Republican-controlled FERC um, that would run through at least June 2021, although he would have a Democratic chair. That's important because without the control of the Senate, which it looks likely he won't have, uh, Biden is likely to look to FERC and its Democratic chair to achieve many of his climate and energy goals, such as decarbonizing the power sector by 2035. Um, they'll look to do this through existing authorities under the Natural Gas Act, HERPA, and NEPA. On the other hand, if President Trump is reelected, we can expect FERC, under the leadership of Chairman Chatterjee, um, who has uh, declared his intention to stay through at least June 2021, to continue to engage in the climate debate, um, much like he has in the past whether it's by review of carbon pricing schemes or implementing President Trump's NEPA reform rules, which uh, FERC will now have to implement uh, in the coming year. So, so expect FERC to continue to heavily engage in this area. Back to you, Dee. That's Christine. I'm going to go to Eric Washburn now. Um, Eric is the co-chair of Sportsmen and Sportswomen for Biden. He's also a former senior Senate Majority Leader, Advisor, and Staff Director at Senate EPW. Eric, can you um, hum a few bars on DOE and EPA, please? Sure. Thank you, Dee. Um, well, given the fact that uh, Biden's probably not going to have a compliant Senate to work with, um, you know, don't look for him 
getting policy done through a reconcili reconciliation bill or even an ambitious climate bill. So he's going to have to do what he's going to do to promote his clean energy and climate agenda administratively. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on EPA. You know, I would suspect you're going to see a new clean power plan, uh, revisiting methane limits, uh, revisiting uh, wetlands protection, for example. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, what we saw in the Obama administration come back this time in a pretty activist EPA. And at DOE, uh, DOE is going to have to play a pretty big role, uh, again, in, in energy innovation. I see kind of a muscular ARPA-E. We'll see if Biden can kind of create administratively his ARPA-C uh, over at DOE. Uh, but I think you're going to see a lot of resources there uh, put into innovation in, in, in uh, green hydrogen, offshore wind, uh, grid integration of renewables, and those sorts of things that will undergird uh, his clean energy agenda. All right, thank you, Eric. And now we're going to round out the hot take section with my colleague Ed Krinick. Uh, Ed is, has nearly 20 years on the Hill and uh, with EPA as a public servant. Ed, uh, let's go to you for your hot take on the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, commission that, similar to the FERC, has five commissioners, normally have five commissioners, is now kind of deadlock at a 2-2 two -two tie. Two Democrats, two Republicans, um, which has resulted in little to nothing getting done out at the commission other than dealing with the various pandemic issues that uh, um, have come across their plate and dealing with enforcement matters. President Trump did nominate a new chairman, uh, Nancy Beck, to take over as the um, chair. Um, and unfortunately, her nomination got stalled in the Senate Commerce Committee. There is a possibility that her um, chairmanship could be taken up uh, it, during the lame duck. And if that is the case, uh, the commission would be three Republicans and two Democrats, which would bode well for the commission in the sense that even if President or even if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, uh, the three Republicans would remain. He would pick a Democratic chair, much like uh, Christine described at FERC, but the voting majority would be in the Republicans. So if Nancy Beck does not get confirmed during the lame duck, then Joe Biden, as the incoming president, uh, would obviously be able to uh, name a chairman, name the vacancy spot that uh, Emory Berthel has vacated, and also uh, an upcoming vacancy, potential vacancy from uh, Commissioner Kay, whose term expired in October and is now currently in his holdover year. So you could see uh, some vast changes out at the commission for manufacturing or consumer product safety issues, um, you know, regardless of who is uh, decided to be the president of the United States. Great analysis, and thank you, Ed. Before we jump into um, our next set of guests, Scott Siegel, I'd like to draw your attention to three questions that have been posed, and I think that you and uh, Ron are best positioned to answer those, but you're not up just yet, so just take a look at them. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to my uh, dear friend, Josh Zive. He and I have had the opportunity to work together for 20 years now. Um, Josh is an attorney here at Bracewell and handles a multitude of issues within the Policy Resolution Group. Josh, you and your very special guests are going to talk about whether or not we're facing a constitutional crisis. Huh, thanks, Dee. Yeah, just a little topic on a on you know just a light morning. Um, but I'm really let let me jump right into the meat of this because I'm really uh, happy and honored to have the guest that I'm going to be talking to today on these legal issues. Uh, let me add the caveat here: I am a lawyer, as are a number of the folks in the policy resolution group team that you're hearing from. But in the world of lawyers, there's a special cabal of uh, giant-brained political lawyers who get called in as strike teams. Uh, to deal with these sorts of cutting-edge, very rare issues. And there's a really small handful of people who have the actual knowledge of how these legal issues play out. And we are lucky to have one of those people here with us today. And that is our guest, Mike Gottlieb. Um, Michael, to be more formal. Uh, but he's, you'll always be Mike to me, Mike. Um, but let me give you his resume, because it's fun to read. Uh, it's 
Mike is the current leader of Wilkie Farr's Crisis Management Group, but for our purposes today, some of the most interesting parts of his resume came before that. Uh, Mike was the Associate White House Counsel to President Obama, and he clerked for Justice Stevens on the Supreme Court during the 2004 elections, where Justice Stevens had jurisdiction over the Sixth and Seventh Circuits that were some of the key disputes. So Mike was involved in briefing and in evaluating all of those legal arguments, and since that point, Mike has uh, been running in that crew of hyper-smart, uh, you know, really smart Democratic lawyers who are involved in this. So there are very few people who will have better insight into these legal issues. And then finally, final resume note before we get to the goods, because this is the Policy Resolution Group. Uh, if you know our group, you know we have a special love for intercollegiate policy debate. Uh, and I would be remiss if I failed to note that Mike also is was voted the best debater in the history of intercollegiate policy debate, winning the college national tournament twice and top speaker at that tournament twice, the only person to ever do that. So he talks pretty, and he's really smart, and I've known him forever. Uh, Mike, thanks for being with us here today. Uh, thanks, Josh. With that introduction, I just hope I don't uh, spit coffee all over the desk from exhaustion. But uh, let's, Well, that's let's well, have, do let's what you got it. Do what you got to do, Mike. We're virtual and we're and we're safe. So spit wherever you got to spit now. Um, but let me frame our discussion by reading um, some words that the president spoke last night, because I think really as we discuss these legal issues, his framing that happened at about 2.20 a.m. last night from the White House uh, has been repeated a lot, I think, through social media and through some of his most loyal supporters. So let me read this to you, Mike, and then we can kind of talk about the legal issues of it. Here's what he said last night. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did the, win this election. So we will be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and then add them to the list, okay? It's very sad. It's a very sad moment. To me, this is a sad moment, and we will win this. And as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. Uh, those words really resonated, I mean, throughout the Internet and the real world. You saw a lot of reactions to them. But, Mike, in our time with you today, I want to talk about what do these actually mean in terms of legal challenges? So starting there, uh, let me pose to you first. What do you see as the major kind of legal issues that are confronting the campaigns, particularly the Biden campaign, after last night? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so it, it can be pretty confusing because uh, – the way election litigation tends to evolve, <clears throat> you have your pre-voting day challenges that, that generally tend to involve um, access issues. In this election, uh, more than any other in history, there were a flurry of lawsuits relating to access to the polls, the period for voting, the way votes were going to be counted uh, because of COVID. Uh, by one count, there were somewhere in the order of 450 to 500 election lawsuits in the states. Um, the majority of those involved COVID-based uh, accommodations, uh, such as uh, the, the kinds of, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, uh, traffic or, or car voting that you saw in Texas or the extensions to the mail-in voting period and issues with the U.S. Postal Service. So that sort of phase of litigation is largely gone. And the phase of litigation that we now shift to is uh, the phase of litigation that takes place in advance of the closing of the canvassing deadlines in all of the relevant states, which varies from state to state, uh, which has to take place in advance of the critical deadline for purposes of federal law, which is the De December 8th safe harbor deadline under the Electoral Count Act. Um, and so right now what matters is looking through the states that are close and, and what the campaigns are doing, what the lawyers who are working with the campaigns are doing is they're looking at the states where the, where the vote margin is close and trying to figure out whether there are legal claims that could potentially alter um, the delta between the two candidates. And unfortunately uh, for, for you, Josh, given your, uh, your love of your original home state and your history, um, Nevada is probably the state where, um, uh, although it's not been most uh, talked about, that's probably the state that the campaigns are taking a really close look at right now because the margin of vote out of this morning is like 8,000 votes and their canvassing deadline is November 16th. Uh, and they can still accept mail-in uh, votes for another week. So that's a pretty small 
margin, it's probably within the range where a recount could take place. And so you could see litigation that could challenge um, certain types of counting that's being done on uh, ballots that are coming in post-election. You saw Republicans try to do that in Pennsylvania, going up to the Supreme Court unsuccessfully a couple of times on that in the last couple of weeks. You could also just see a plain recount suits uh, taking place once the uh, um, once the count, uh, canvassing uh, uh, period closes. Um, so there, there are a lot of different alternatives there, and we could talk about the different states, um, but, but that's sort of what the campaigns are doing right now. They're looking at different states where there might be a, a margin of victory that could be litigated. So you think, and, and initially, you're, that's interesting because I don't think you're right. I don't think we've seen a lot of discussion of Nevada. There was a discussion occurring online about it, but you're thinking that's one of the states that there could be significant legal action around. It's possible. I mean, the, the, the difficulty for the Republicans is that they've got to find a claim that uh, potentially puts enough ballots in play. That what type of, be, when you say a claim, what, what is that type of claim that someone would make? Right. So, um, I mean, if you think about the suits that the Republicans brought in Pennsylvania, they brought suits to challenge late arriving mail-in ballots. So mail-in ballots or absentee ballots that were coming in postmarked before yesterday, postmarked on or before yesterday, but arriving after the election. There have been a bunch of challenges brought saying you can't do that. You can't accept ballots um, after election day either because it's not specifically provided for in state law or violates some other provision of state uh, election statute. So they could try to do that in Nevada. The problem is that uh, uh, Vice President Biden is already ahead by 8,000 vote, votes before you even look at uh, ballots that are coming in after uh, after today or after yesterday. Um, so that's unlikely to change the outcome. They could um, try to make procedural challenges that the way that certain ballots were tabulated or counted violated state election procedures. Maybe they, they, the, the Republican Party in Nevada tried to do this last night. They went to the Nevada Supreme Court and argued that they weren't allowed to, they weren't being allowed to monitor um, the counting of mail-in ballots and therefore the process was essentially defective and all the ballots should be thrown out. The Nevada Supreme Court rejected that, but those are the kinds of claims we could continue to try to make. Um, and outside of Nevada, I mean, Wisconsin is also incredibly close. It's 20,000 votes as of this morning, uh, which is within 1% uh, margin, and they've got a canvassing deadline of November 17th. So you could see uh, potential claims being brought in Wisconsin as well. And are these, you know, you hear these claims being brought, are these easy claims to win? I mean, it's one thing to bring a claim, it's another thing to be successful in these sorts of claims. How often are these sorts of claims actually successful? It's, incredi it's incredibly rare. Um, I mean, it's one thing, if you've got a, if you've got a, um, you know, a Bush versus Gore style margin, if you've got a 540 vote margin with millions of vote casts, um, then recount litigation becomes possible because it's easy to imagine flipping under a thousand votes in a state the size of Florida. Um, you know, 8,000 votes in Nevada, a little more challenging, uh, more difficult, particularly if that, if that grows, not out of the realm of the possible, but it, it, it sort of becomes hard to imagine how on an individual ballot recount they got that many ballots wrong or, you know, that many ballots should have been thrown out. So these, these are very, very difficult. The other issue just in terms of <clears throat> the procedural aspect of these litigation is that you're talking about <clears throat> recount litigation. That's primarily going to be proceeding in state court or right. in state law. And um, the, the states tend to um, uh, proceed uh, under procedures that have been developed over you know, uh, many, many decades uh, under state election regimes that differ from state to state. And it's only really been a few times in our history that that type of litigation has turned into federal litigation that then goes on to the Supreme Court, Bush v. Gore being the obvious um, uh, paradigm case of that. Uh, but it's pretty difficult to turn recount litigation uh, that we're talking about here into federal litigation that finds its way to the Supreme Court. Not impossible, but it's pretty difficult. Well, that's good. And you, 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 you for you, you saw my next question coming, which was the president said we're going to the U.S. Supreme Court. He said that last night at 2 a.m. Um, can you tell us what does that mean, or do you know what that means? Like, what are they going to the Supreme Court with? Uh, you know, some, uh, sometimes you see a movie with uh, you know a, a trial lawyer that's standing outside of the trial and saying, "We're taking this all the way to the Supreme Court. We're putting the system on trial." <laughs> So I, I kind of interpret the president's comments 
to be equivalent to that. I mean, it, it, you can't just take, uh, you can't file a, a, a original action in the Supreme Court demanding that the count stop. And, and at this point, you wouldn't want to because the president is behind right. uh, in the counts and in, in the states that he would need to win. So he would need to uh, have his lawyers bring challenges to counts in the states in which he is behind, claiming that there was an undercount, uh, and and challenges to counts in the states where um, uh, where he is ahead to try to shut down the count. So um, it's it's a it's a very very tall order uh, given the way the uh, the counting appears to be heading in you know Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. That said, I mean if 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 uh, if President Trump held on to Pennsylvania and if Wisconsin and, and Georgia. Uh, and if Wisconsin and Nevada remain sort of razor thin, I, I would definitely expect them to try uh, to bring some type of challenge, some type of recount uh, procedure, and litigate whatever they can in those state courts in advance of that December 8th safe harbor deadline and hope that maybe they can get action from a state legislature, uh, maybe they can get uh, some other type of action to um, force, uh, force the hand of the people doing the counting. Well, that's that's great. I, I mean, and we've, we've hit most of the bases I wanted. I, I want to ask a very particular question of you, Mike, because you, as I mentioned, you clerked on the Supreme Court. You, you have one of the very few people on the planet who can actually speak to the way that these recusal discussions might actually go down. Uh, there's been some talk about what role would the newest justice on the Supreme Court play in this litigation, Amy Coney Barrett. Do you have any thoughts on 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 that? Which you would she be required to recuse? Is there such a thing as being required to recuse? What or is that just is that just chatter that most people should ignore? I'd, I'd put it in that category. Um, there, there's no requirement that any justice recuse in any case. It's a, a standard that is enforced by the justices themselves based off of a determination of whether their impartiality could be questioned. And um, I think that uh, the, the history of recusal decisions um, <clears throat> does not uh, make it likely that the newest justice would recuse herself uh, in election litigation simply because she was uh, appointed, um, you know, very close in time to the election by the incumbent president. Um, it, it, it seems unlikely. Now, you know, whether whether she would be interested in being a fifth vote in a, uh, you know, outcome determinative case. Um, you know, whether it was Wisconsin or Nevada or Pennsylvania, if it went in that direction, that's another question, and I can't answer that. Uh, but um, I, I find it um, highly unlikely that if we were, if we found ourselves in that situation, that she would recuse herself from the case. Well, that's that's very helpful, and, and thank you for that, Mike. Mike, I want to thank you for giving us the time today. Um, I know you're busy, and you're probably going to get you know, shipped off to some legal fight somewhere, maybe in Nevada. So if you, if you go out there, say hello to my, my dad. Um, but short of that, Mike, thank you for giving us this time. I know you're tired and you're busy, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. And I am happy at this point in the program, just like I was handed off to by my friend of 20 years, to hand off to my friend of even longer than that and another proud member of the PRG uh, college policy debate nerd world, and that's uh, my old friend Scott Siegel. Scott, take it away. Thanks very much, Josh. Uh, and Mike, that was a, both of you, that was a fantastic tutorial. I mean, I, I, I you know, clear-headed, a lot of options. It's my pleasure to introduce an old friend of mine, Ron, Ron Minsk is a former special assistant to President Obama for Energy and Environment at the White House National Economic Council. He served in a similar capacity from 98 to 2001 in the Clinton White House, and he's currently a fellow at Columbia University Center for Global Energy Policy. And um, uh, and Ron is just the kind of guy you want to have when you're looking at um, energy, energy and environmental issues, either in a new administration, particularly a Democratic administration, or when you're contemplating what a second term of an administration might look like. So we're gonna, we're gonna do about the biggest change from the status quo, obviously, is if there's a change in administration. So we'll probably focus a little bit, on that, but then we'll make some time also to discuss what are some of the challenges you face in a second term. 
Now, we've had a couple of questions come in uh, on energy and environmental issues. And I kind of want to I kind of want to put those on the table first. So, Ron, this is off script a little bit. Super is uh, this election seems to imply a lot of superheated polarization. Uh, what, is, what does that kind of polarization mean for energy policy on on a going forward basis? And um, I'm going to get started by, by simply saying polarization has been a real fact of life. Uh, you know, for, for the last several years in the energy and environmental space, a second Trump term would look a lot like uh, previous, uh, previous time spent here. Uh, and as I said in my overview at the very top, I think the personal relationship between my number of members of the U.S. Senate, uh, specifically the Senate Majority Leader, uh, might be such that it could, it could actually reduce polarization on key agenda items where there's a compromise to be had and energy and environment might be so with that long wind up, polarization, Ron Minsk, how do you deal with it? And what do you think this election means for polarization in the energy and environment field? Well, well thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. You know, I, I think you kind of um, hit the top, hit the nail right on the head there. I mean, this is an issue that has been a particularly polarizing issue um, in recent years. And it, I think it really just comes down to how the Senate um, chooses to work this out. You know, it's it's hard for me to figure out right now where President Vice President Biden to win, and yet the Senate to remain in Republican hands. Just how the Republicans, um, you know, how combative an approach that they're going to take to, you know, um, in a, a Biden administration set of policies. You know, um, uh, Leader McConnell, you know, in the Obama administration, uh, took a pretty rigid stand. Um, you know, declaring at one point his, you know, his primary purpose was to make Obama a one-term president. It, it was a pretty serious roadblock. You know, I think in this particular context, might you find, um, my, my sense is there are some Republicans there who would be supportive of at least some of the items in Biden's agenda. The question is whether or not they'll feel that they are in a position to be able to support it. And I, I just think it's it's hard to tell, but it's it's better that Biden has a good history with the Senate than if it were someone else who did not. Right, right. Uh, we've also been asked about uh, the Trump administration's earlier efforts to help out coal and nuclear via you know, great resiliency and other uh, uh, other life classic of uh, for advance from the Department of Energy to the FERC to try and, and whether we thought the second Trump term would would, uh, would return to some of those first principles. Now. You know, it, it wasn't particularly successful the first time around, but I have not, I have not seen anything in the Trump administration which is indicative of, of the fact that they have come off of the argument that the base load power necessitates, uh, you know, a uh, coal a uh, participation of coal. So even though that didn't really assist those two industries who have very particularized problems in the marketplace right now. As a matter of policy, I, I think they would be in that same situation. Whether they would discover new uh, authorities, uh, I, would, I would I would direct people back to what Christine Lyman was saying that there'll be a more active role within the FERC to address carbon, maybe even carbon pricing. So that, depending on how you give credit for resiliency in such a, in such a situation, could uh, could be meaningful for most public nuclear. But uh, all in all. Um, I think you saw in, when the president addressed the blackouts in California and basically blamed them on renewable energy, uh, you, you see where he is in terms of uh, reliability and the need for baseload. So I think you will see that in the second term. Whether you can get anything across the finish line, I don't think the situation is as it was during the first term. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. That's I'm just, I was just answering a question there, but do you, do you have uh, thoughts on that, Ron? No, I, I think that he will, I agree that I don't see any indication that his position has changed, and I am guessing right. that they will look for any path that they can possibly find. He has not been shy in trying to exercise the authorities of the president um, in reality or the authorities that he believes the president, that he and only he believes the president has. So I, I, I would expect that he'll keep looking. You know, I, I would think that there's perhaps a chance that they haven't always done so well in complying with the strictures of the Administrative Procedure Act, and I do think that maybe they'll learn a little bit, but, you know, it's hard to tell if this guy's going to learn. 
Yeah, and, and the you know, use of the bully pulpit to write executive orders. I mean, on Halloween, you know, he, he wrote an executive memorandum dealing with hydraulic fracturing and shale right. development. And while it just reiterated more of the status quo, it, it still was a, a restatement of, of administration policy. Yes. So it's certainly not above restating administration policy. Uh, let, let's assume for a moment, though, that Biden takes over the White House for a second. Obviously, you know well, uh, you know, um, I'm not saying you know Joe Biden personally, but you know him, but you know him as, as Vice President of the United States uh, a time when, when you were there. During the last debate uh, between Biden and Trump, um, uh, Biden referred to a transition away from fossil fuel. He didn't really, uh, and the, word, the key word there was transition, and he didn't assign a particular time frame to it. What do you think he meant by transition, and do you think this is like a precipitous action, or is this a gradual action? Uh, what, what do you think? What yeah, do you think? Transition. What's it mean? You know, I think that it is, you know, going to be a more gradual move towards a net zero uh, carbon emission economy. I think that while there may be some um, parts of the Democratic Party that would like to see something um, perhaps more precipitous, I think that uh, Vice President Biden probably has a pretty clear view that you want to manage this in a way that um, helps preserve American jobs. Um, and that uh, that doesn't create more that doesn't create too too much um, disruption. And I think that when you when you hear people talking about you know a quick time frame 2030 2035, um, that seems pretty quick to me. And I don't see that. I think it's been very pragmatic, and that's actually reflected in his approach to fracking, for instance. So. Well, let's pick up on that 2035 issue for a second because. <laughs> There have been uh, a lot of limitations, basically, um, in, the, in the current administration shifting to renewables that include things like tax policy uh, and the failure to come to shore on tax policy. And Tim Urban's going to talk about that in a second. And also renewables policy. So, uh, you know, as a general proposition, the president's doubt about renewables. And also trade policy, restriction on uh, – on uh, using components that manufactured overseas or, or even uh, solar photovoltaics that are made in China. You, you know, uh, Biden has some of those same trade instincts. You think the issues are resolved if, uh, if Biden, on the one hand, wants a big transition for clean energy. On the other hand, he wants it all made in the United States, and he wants to, he, he likes, uh, he, he's not totally devoid of the notion of restraints on trade. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I don't think he's going to become a hardcore protectionist, but what I do think is that there's a growing, um, I think there's a growing understanding that there are risks in having our supply chains for critical uh, technology and critical products that run through countries that may not perhaps be as reliable as we would like. So I can appreciate that, for instance, if you look in the, you know, in the, in the, telecom space where they've, you know, uh, tried to limit the use of Chinese um, equipment in, in the, in the uh, mobile technology space. I think you can see stuff like that. I think there's a, perhaps a, a recognition that if electric vehicles are the vehicles of the future and if batteries are the key components, that we don't want to essentially lose all of those jobs. I mean, all the people who are now making engines and transmissions and fuel systems and exhaust systems those jobs tend to go away. They're replaced by battery manufacturing, and you probably don't want to lose that to China. And I think that there'll be a recognition that if you're trying to make that transition, which he's talked about with EVs, for instance, you want to make it in a way that is good for the environment, but also protects the you know the jobs that are you know many of which are located in the in the states that we've been actually focusing on in the past couple hours. Right. Well, uh, speaking of speaking of uh, automobility, um, there's also a lot of discussion in this energy plan regarding hydrogen as uh, something not only for energy storage on the, uh, on, on the utility and industrial side, but also as, as something that could work in automobiles. What, uh, do, you, do, you, do you think he is so married to electric vehicles that he's heart for an aggressive hydrogen policy, too? And for that matter, a policy to improve automobile efficiency that could be utilized for liquid motor fuels. What would? 
You know, I think that that? There, there's, there's a sense that there's, a, you know, a place for hydrogen perhaps, maybe with, um, you know, heavier vehicles that might be able to play a role where, where um, batteries may be more of a problem. I mean, you know, uh, hydrogen fuel cells are often, are, are still, uh, you know, um, electric ride cranes, um, but there may be certain advantages um, in terms of how they operate. The challenge, of course, is you don't really have much of a fueling infrastructure in place, where is with electricity, you have most of the infrastructure you need, you know, almost down to the plug, which you just kind of um, need to install. I think with respect to liquid fuels, you know, um, it's going to be a trend. This isn't going to happen overnight, and I think that he appreciates, you know, the need. Um, I think he's got to figure out how to deal with those vehicles during a period of transition. I think an open question, you know, if you're an automaker, you're sitting here thinking, do you want to be told that you both have to make your cars be more, your ICE cars more efficient at the same time you're having to develop electric cars, or do they sit here and say, we're going to maybe slow down, you know, become less aggressive on the internal combustion engine vehicles, but be more aggressive in the batteries so that we're in electric vehicles, so that we're not trying to, um, you know, push in two directions at the same time. They're capital constraints, and I think they need to recognize that. Um, quest, let, me, let me switch focus a little bit. Let's make the assumption that uh, the, the pieces of the puzzle don't come together for Biden, even though it, it looks like these late, you know, these late ballots that have been counted yeah. have a, a ratio of favorability toward the Democrats. But let's assume for a moment that doesn't come together. Or some, one of these litigation strategies that Mike Gottlieb and Josh Zion talked about, you know, lightning strikes, and, and one of those is useful. What, uh, and if there is a second term, you were a White House staffer. You worked on policy issues in, in two different White Houses. What? And, and in each of those White Houses, you were, we were dealing with two-term presidents. Yeah. What, what are, the, are there unique challenges in a, uh, in a, a second term, uh, obstacles that they face, particularly in the energy and environment space? Well, I think the bigger question in terms of obstacles is really whether or not he has a Congress that wants to work with him um, or not, number one. I think something that's also different about um, President Trump than perhaps the two presidents for whom I worked, Clinton and Obama, is that they had what I would think of as characterizing more of a proactive agenda. There were things that they wanted to actually get done, um, whereas it seems like a lot of President Trump's environmental and energy agenda has been trying to undo things that others have done. And it may be a little easier uh, to do that on, on, on margin. I mean, you know, there there is also just the risk when you're dealing well, I guess he would have, he wouldn't have Congress on the side because of the House. You know, part of the challenge is, and this is what Obama faced, because he didn't have, when he picked up on his climate action plan in the second term, he didn't have Congress with him. And it was essentially a regulatory approach, regulatory and spending. And you can do a lot, but it's really hard to make it durable. You know, I, I think the New York Times has a list of environmental and energy regulations that President Trump has undone. And I seem to recall that the list is somewhere near 100. I don't know what the number is, but certainly it's harder to make things durable um, if you're operating in that context. Right. Now, I can see that. I can see that. Um, hey, and while you're talking about executive action, assuming the Senate stays the way it is and assuming Biden uh, uh, is elected, um, do you have a do you have a, a top one or two things that you think he would use in terms of executive authority in the energy and environment space? Because obviously he'll be in the same situation if he can't negotiate an outcome with the Senate. He'll be, he'll be left with executive authorities too. Well, I, I think that he would certainly um, do something reminiscent of the clean power plan. I think that power stationary sources um, are certainly an issue. You know, I, I'm sure also on, on mobile, He'll want to do something. I think you know. Again, the question is, how do you deal with the the the, the kind of fork in the road? How much more do you push them on, on internal combustion vehicles as opposed to how much of an effort do you put in batteries? What are they going to do with cafe? Are they going to make it more aggressive? Are they going to kind of make a new pathway? Um, you know, for for electric. And, and by the same token, a lot of what you a lot of what electric would help it. Uh, might only not be regulatory, but also money. And it may be easier to find money for that, especially if the money is going to places where it will benefit, um, 
you know, some of the Republican senators' constituencies who he, whose support he would need. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think that's kind of the question that you got. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, I think power plants and, you know, he'll, he'll go forward and vehicles will try to figure out a way. Yeah. I mean, I, I quite agree with you that uh, sometimes, sometimes the activity that lasts and the regulation or the guidance are the things that blow with the wind. Uh, as uh, as you put it, durability is hard to is hard is hard to obtain. I think about projects like carbon capture and sequestration. I think about uh, energy storage, whether that be in the form of batteries or whether it be in the form of hydrogen we mentioned or other other mechanisms. Um, I think of uh, I think of uh, next generation for fuel. I think of next generation for energy technology and all of these things. We have an apparatus right now that can assist. With re with research and development, and I just want to add to that commercialization and deployment, which is I think a, a healthy next step uh, when we look at how we do energy R and D. Certainly, any... no, I was just oh. going to say that certainly when you think about you know batteries, for instance, I mean that's a place where I can see that republic at least some Republicans would appreciate <coughs> pardon me, the importance of that technology in the future, and at least they will willing to spend some money so that we can make some advances both in terms of cost and energy density, which would help both in energy storage in the grid and, and vehicles as well. So I think spending may be a place where it could be a little easier, you know, but if you spend money and make progress in CCS, that can be really valuable. Spend money, you know, develop a small nuclear, sure. modular nuclear, that can be helpful. So. As always, this has been a, a great discussion with you, uh, very challenging, We got and we even got in some of these questions, which I think is awesome. So uh, I'm now going, if I have my room closed somewhere here, let's see what it tells us to do. I can, ah, yes, I can let you go, and I uh, prefigured that the next person to talk is going to be uh, my colleague, uh, Tim Urban, who uh, is an uh, an expert on tax policy generally, but specifically has 20 years of time, uh, of longer actually, uh, in service at the nexus point between energy policy and tax policy. So that's uh, a, a good segue for us. So Ron, I uh, ask you to mute. And Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. And Tim, let me turn to you. Hey, thanks, Scott. Uh, just to start off, I think we can quickly dispose of the hypothesis if the president is reelected uh, with regard to tax policy with kind of three major points, and then we can move on. One is, you know, uh, the expectation would be he would spend a lot of his time defending the Tax Cut and Job Act bill that was passed in 2017. Democrats have, you know, made uh, noises about wanting to disassemble it. So that would probably be one of his highest priorities. Uh, second thing is I think that we all know he and his senior cabinet officials have expressed skepticism with regard to tax incentives for renewables and energy efficiency, et cetera. So I think we could continue to see kind of an uphill climb, very incremental amount of progress in that regard. And then lastly, I think there is a wild card with regard to infrastructure. Uh, President Trump has made noises about his interest in infrastructure in the past. Um, in a second term, perhaps he would see that as kind of his legacy item and be willing to deal with the speaker in order to get uh, a big bill. But, you know, moving on, I, I would like to talk a little bit about if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, I think if he's elected, I think you could see the, the new president, his treasury officials, and house leaders kind of coming out of the gates very aggressively with a very dramatic agenda. I think you could see revi reversing or revising the 2017 tax cut bill would be one of those items. I think, uh, you know, looking to clamp down on aggressive corporate tax avoidance and individual high-income taxpayers. I think you could see revisiting Obama administration proposals to repeal oil and gas tax incentives, loophole closers, all that kind of stuff, and very robust incentives for clean energy and environmentally beneficial behavior. Now, all that being said, if indeed uh, it, it's a Biden presidency with a Republican Senate, I think you know many of us would see that there, there may actually be two different tranches of these proposals. One would be proposals that are sort of message proposals uh, designed to you know mollify uh, the, the base and to make a point towards perhaps some future time. And then a subset of those proposals that would be more realistic in terms of their ability to be sold to uh, Senate Republicans. And uh, so with regard to the ones I think that are less likely to be immediate uh, objects of negotiation with, uh, with the Senate Majority Leader, if it's Mitch McConnell, I think a carbon tax 
you know, repeal of swaths of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, wholesale repeal of oil and gas tax incentives, doubling the guilty tax, and enactment of new alternative minimum taxes. You know, I think those things are, are frankly, you know, maybe outside of their reach unless they have also secured uh, the Senate and they have the ability to perform a, a budget reconciliation bill or even repeal the filibuster. So assuming all that, I, I do think it's important to think about some of the vehicles that could be out there because, of course, you know, in, in tax, it's very important you have to have a revenue bill to carry these tax provisions. Uh, starting with the lame duck uh, this year, you know, there still could be discussion of a COVID tax relief package, passenger airline tax relief, extension of temporary tax provisions, and then early next year, I think you could see potentially a bipartisan discussion of a robust infrastructure package, uh, restructuring highway taxes, and some sort of COVID economic recovery package, which would be very different than just uh, short-term COVID tax relief. Moving on to talk about things that could be more popular is a bipartisan proposals. I think there has been historically uh, a lot of uh, support for extensions of popular temporary tax provisions called the so-called extenders including the Craft Beverage Modernization Act, short-line railroads, biodiesel blenders credits. Um, I think there are popular renewables that have bipartisan uh, constituencies with energy efficiency, solar, offshore wind, cellulosic ethanol. Uh, uh, additionally, I think there's one area that's very ripe for bipartisan compromise. You know, there are certain industries that are sort of developing important components for eventually decarbonizing the economy, which sort of straddle Republican and Democratic constituencies, so hydrogen vehicles and refueling uh, property, uh, hydrogen storage, uh, and uh, 45Q carbon sequestration. I think these things are all things that, that are kind of ripe for a compromise if people are in the right mood. I do think given the prospects for movement in the next Congress, you know, taxpayers are very well advised to think about how their proposals fit into this world and to investigate how, you know, their bottom line can be affected both as you know, opportunities and vulnerabilities. And, and with that, Scott, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Liam. Appreciate the uh, uh, handoff here. I'm excited to kind of bring things back around full circle. And I think we have a great person here to uh, help us pick up some of the threads discussed by the previous speakers. We've got uh, Jeff Stein, who is the White House economics reporter for the Washington Post. He has been an absolute beast on the beat of following the COVID stimulus package, really everything that's going on in the Capitol of late. And I'm uh, anxious to hear what he has to say. So, Jeff, we've got an interesting verdict rendered by the voters here, split decision at best. I think it's hard to say what happens in the first 100 days without figuring out what happens in the next 60 days. But how do you see this election scrambling the incentives for the things that do have to get done in this lame, lame duck session? What do you see happening in the immediate future here? You know, it's interesting because I got um, – text already this morning from a bunch of Republican aides who, to my surprise, were actually more bullish on the odds of a stimulus getting done than they had been um, really for months. And their attitude is sort of that Pelosi's leverage to hold out as, uh, you know, assuming, you know, we don't know yet, but assuming that Republicans keep the Senate, Pelosi, in, in the minds of many Republicans, has been waiting to see if she could get a Dem trifecta. And if she could get that from her perspective, why make a compromise with Republicans that could have boosted Trump. Now that we're past the election and it looks like Republicans may hold the Senate, Pelosi's incentives to go forward with a, a deal um, may, may be stronger now because her, her bargaining position isn't going to get better into the future. Um, I think the big uncertain, you know, obviously the big uncertain thing that has clouded a lot of these negotiations is is that nobody really knows where the president is going to stand. I talked to a number of people uh, in the White House and outside the White House who were unsure of, of if, you know, President Trump has demanded a $1.8 trillion stimulus, he told Mnuchin and Meadows, to get a deal done. Um, some former White House officials who were uh, high up on the economic side told me on record that they don't think Trump is going to continue to push for a stimulus deal once it's no longer in his political self-interest. And if Trump is spending the next few months saying that the Democrats have, you know, stolen the election from him, if Trump is, you know, claiming that without evidence, the odds that he's going to take time to go to the table with Pelosi and get a good deal seems pretty thin, especially given that that deal will likely redound to the political benefit of Joe Biden. Um, I think it's also, you know, maybe we discussed this, but accelerating economic 
problems that we're going to see in the next few months in this lame duck. Uh, we had a front page story on it um, the day before the election. It's, it's really scary. Um, there's a lot of headwinds. We've seen, obviously, we had a summer and fall recovery somewhat, but it looks like we're sputtering a bit. Uh, the ADP job numbers private payroll survey was a huge miss on expectations. They were expecting, you know, 700,000 jobs. We got closer to 300,000. We'll get later this week the jobs numbers. But, you know, just, just to rattle up some, some facts quickly, the travel industry is expecting to lose another million jobs in the next couple months, restaurants, 40% of them could close nationwide. I mean, just, just think about that for a second. Take, you know, your 10 favorite restaurants. Imagine four of them closing, all of their wait staffs, all of their servers, um, cashiers, everyone getting laid off. Um, hotels, two in three could close without a stimulus deal by February. Unemployment benefits for over 20 million people have expired. The government um, shutdown looms on December 11th, uh, if they don't get a deal on that. Um, protections for renters, student borrowers, um, for hungry Americans, those are all coming offline by the end of the year. And we have no idea what the incentive structure for the president is going to be or if he's going to take his ball and go home. So it's a, it's a really scary time. I mean, there is some optimism, but but I've been reporting different congressional aides telling me optimistic things for a long time. I had people in the White House saying that they thought they were going to get a deal done, and that was total BS. So, um, you know, I, I, I remain very bearish on, on the economy in the next few months um, with stimulus. I'm certain a lot of deep, deep pain for workers in particular sectors and a lot of unclarity, lack, lack of clarity at the political level. So you mentioned one thing there with the December 11th uh, um, uh, deadline to fund the government. And um, do we have a sense? I mean, I think you mentioned it, but it's unclear in, until we see how the president approaches this this period um, and and you know some of the potential for um, a transition. Uh, but do we have a sense of? You know, does this make a CR more likely? Do you think there might be a bigger omnibus package that gets us into next year? Or, you know, I'm just trying to tick off the things that do have to get done uh, in the next few months. I think one of the big looming question marks on that question is what happens with this, uh, the uh, Obamacare decision in front of the Supreme Court. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of, nobody really knows exactly what's going to happen there, but if, some, if the court comes down with a decision that effectively leads millions of people to lose their health care in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, we, again, we don't know that, but I think that could make the CR battle very messy. I mean, I've, I've been hearing for months now that, you know, they'll, they'll try to get some of the most bipartisan things through the CR, you know, maybe some limited unemployment extension, maybe another round of PPP money, maybe airline relief. They'll, they'll sneak that in, in the omnibus, but... Once you start opening that up, that clean extension up to other negotiations, it gets very messy because members are territorial, the head of the finance committee and the head of the appropriations committee will want what they think are essential, you know, non-controversial things to get through, and then that will lead other members to say, well, what about this non-controversial thing? And you could have a very dangerous back and forth. I think no one wants to see a government shutdown. You know, is the president going to be leading these negotiations in a way that um, ensures that there isn't a shutdown after he's, you know, potentially lost. Trump <laughs> was not necessarily the most effective negotiator, you know, on the government shutdown before, you know, when he had an, every incentive to do a responsible job, um, obviously longest government shutdown in American history under his watch. So, um, I, you know, I think nobody really knows, to answer your question, whether the, the CR will turn into an omnibus. We'll definitely hear a lot of rumors about that going forward, but I would be very skeptical um, that, you know, things that have um, sort of, that are, that are controversial will get there. And, and remember, you know, Senate Republicans went along, you know, Liam, you know this better than anyone, that Senate Republicans went along with a lot of messaging bills for McConnell's sake that a lot of the right flank was not happy about, Paul and Cruz, they weren't really, you know, they voted for it, but they weren't really on board with a lot of the, the things McConnell was putting and, and pushing through the Senate. You know, if, if Trump is out of the scene, does that mean that they make a bigger stink, not just about an omnibus, but even about a CR? I mean, that's, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but it's, it's certainly worth watching.
Well, let's take a look a little bit around the corner. I feel like even in the last hour that we've been talking here, there's been some expression of confidence from the Biden camp. Um, it does look like uh, Republicans have the inside track uh, on keeping the Senate. Let's think about that scenario and what it would mean for um, a first 100 days. And even, let's say, uh, if the president's posture and attitudes and maybe some of the incentives get scrambled such that we do slip into um, uh, the, the beginning of the year with a stimulus, does the size, scope, scale, and character of a COVID relief package look different um, in the current balance of power versus, you know, a, a divided government where a Joe Biden does have, um, you know, the, the lever of power there? I think the, the big question there is, what happens to Republican economic policy post-Trump? It was, um, you know, this obvious tug of war. We reported that Mitch McConnell had told the White House to delay a vote on the stimulus until after the election. It was clearly a reflection of a lot of nervousness. You know, they just mentioned about Republicans on, on you know, the spending levels that Trump wanted. But it, do we see the, the real fierce reemergence of the Republican deficit hawks? And does that limit the size of the Biden stimulus. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, when you talk to the Biden people, as I had, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, you sort of asked what happens if you get a trifecta. The consensus that I was sort of hearing was they wanted to go really, really, really big and not just on stimulus, but the the sort of reading the tea leaves and what, what they had suggested to me was that they expected them to be able to conv- combine their infrastructure package with the stimulus, with virus suppression. So you would have had a massive, you know, bigger than $3 trillion package in a Dem trifecta that would have thrown all of this money at, um, you know, way bigger than what, you know, even Trump's negotiators have offered. Um, but I think that's, you know, virtually all hopes that that have been eliminated. And I think, you know, with, with you know, Republicans likely keeping the Senate and, Moreover, I think, you know, sort of the close result, much closer than a lot of people expected, I think, may um, may give the Biden people, this is pure speculation, but may give Biden people a sense that the electorate is still quite conservative and may not be as, as open to the sort of FDR-style progressive change that, you know, we had some kind of, in retrospect, um, little silly articles saying that Biden was going to usher in this, you know, biggest government spending spree since FDR. I, I think, you know, na- like the, the nail is in that coffin, um, even if the Senate tightens. It's just the, the margins are too tight for the Biden people to think they have a mandate for a, a sweeping left populist vision, at least as I see it. Maybe maybe others disagree, but that's my initial take this morning. By the same token, I think the most surprising thing, at least for me, was the, um, the ability of Republicans to, to actually pick up seats in the House. Um, how do you see that impacting Pelosi's hold on her caucus and the posture of you know that dynamic between the, the progressives in the House and the kind of frontline Democrats who kind of took it on the chin last night? Um, how does that inform the policy agenda and the dynamic with the Biden administration? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not really sure. I think it was, you know, I've heard a lot of anger um, from the House Democrats I checked in with last night and this morning. and their attitude is sort of like, I mean, maybe they'll calm down tomorrow or whatever when we get the final tally, but their initial gut reaction was, you know, the, the D-trip was telling us that this was going to be a huge night for House Democrats, dramatic expansion in their margins, that Pelosi had masterfully manipulated the White House into this likely historic expansion of Democratic majorities and potential Democratic Senate, and I think there's frustration. Um, are the people who are telling me that the rabble rousers who are already there and likely to be silenced? Like maybe you know, um, but uh, it's it's uh, you know I think a lot of people expected when Trump, you know, when Republicans swept in 2016, a lot of people said, well, why is Pelosi still the standard bearer for the House Democrat? And she was extremely effective at crushing that rebellion. You know, the House is not. You know, it works on internal dynamics, on a sort of patronage system, committee membership, allegiance, fundraising, and those dynamics can sometimes outweigh the sense that the Democratic Party should have done better. Um, We've seen that already, and we could see it again. Let's make the bull case for a productive first 100 days 
thinking about Biden walking in with a deep, you know, well of you know relationships and understanding of how these chambers work, of what levers the press, and you know, both as a senator and in his time as vice president, he was able to make deals with Mitch McConnell. Um, what are the sorts of things? I know infrastructure has been mentioned a few times, but what are the sorts of things that could potentially get done under the right circumstances um, if Biden wanted to? do what he's been saying throughout the campaign. I want to work with Republicans, and if Republicans sort of return that uh, posture, what do you see as, as possible? Not much, honestly. I mean, I, I think infrastructure, like the dynamics on that for a long time now have been that everyone likes the word infrastructure, and then the agreement sort of stops there. I mean, that's a bit of an overstatement, but, you know, Republicans disagree about how to pay for it, where the money should go, what kinds of infrastructure to fund. Um, with Democrats. I think on, on taxes, we could see maybe some extension of the more popular parts of the Republican tax law. I think the CTC, the standard deduction, will get in and maybe SALT gets in the mix there. Um, there are some Republicans who have been uneasy about that, but you know the vast majority of the Biden tax agenda is dead in Mitch McConnell's Senate. Um, I, I think it was going to have trouble already in a, in a Democratic Congress, but now it certainly seems fried to me. Um, I think Maybe we get something on virus suppression. I think, you know, there are a number of Republicans who think that they're, that the White House has not done a great job containing the virus, and we could see, you know, plus-ups for different agencies. And, you know, I was talking to, to a reporter on our team who, co- who follows this more closely this morning, and she was making the point that, um, you know, there's actually a lot that can be done um, by the agencies and with, with help from Congress. So I, I actually kind of think McConnell is not going to stand in the way of um, sort of to help contain the virus. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm, I don't think anything's happening on health care. Um, I think unemployment benefits are going to be extremely difficult. Um, you know, stimulus checks I cover very closely. I am skeptical that those get done again. Um, I could be wrong, but I sort of doubt it. State and local money is going to be really, really, really hard. Um, so, there, I mean, maybe another round of PPP, but this small bore stuff, given the, the economic turmoil we're facing, and, you know, if the unemployment rate is, you know, we're going to get this number later, and if it's a big hit, um, we are in for a really rough winter and, and potential first 100 days as well. Yeah, that is, that is a, a good answer, and I think uh, one that we'll, we'll have to uh, wrestle with and see how these next few days and weeks shake out. Jeff, appreciate your time. I'm going to hand it back over to Scott, but uh, we'll be watching your work and look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thanks for having me. That was tremendous. Thanks very much. What a great way to, what a great way to take us out, frankly, on, uh, on, on this uh, webinar. Uh, and I want to thank people for spending time with us. I know we're over time at this point by about 17 minutes, but I'm reliably informed we still have over 300 people signed in, so that's good. And therefore, I'm going to sing a song. No, no, no. Um, I don't I, – I, I, uh, Dan, I'm looking at you. Uh, we have a few questions that are queued up, but I think these questions are better answered uh, with, with short, direct uh, uh, answering uh, in writing. We'll answer those separately. Yeah, being that we're already a little bit over time. So let me thank everybody for your attention to this. What a day yesterday. I'm sure you're still wiping sleep out of your eyes and drinking your next cup of coffee. Uh, Thank you in particular to our guests, to Jeff Stein, to Ron Minsk, uh, to Mike Gottlieb, who provided some additional insight. Thank you to all of my, uh, my PRG colleagues who I think showed on display what makes them a really special group to work with. And a lot of, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a lot of fun for clients to work with as well because of their unique expertise, their political sense, uh, and their policy chops. So uh, thanks, everybody, for for showing up and bringing the A game after a trying night last night. So we'll see, as we suggested at the very top, we may have answers by the end of the evening uh, tonight or it may drag on a few more days, but however it happens, you'll be sure that you will hear from PRD about our hot takes on, on what it all means. So uh, thanks, everybody. And, uh, Dee, do you want to say goodbye also? No, just thank you. Goodbye. Keep an eye on your inbox for a link and additional material. And remember, for any of you that are still on there, 
irrespective of the outcome, how that flanges up with who you supported or didn't support, I think it's important to remind ourselves we're all Americans. This is the government we've been dealt, and we're, we, we need to make good uh, and proceed in a, in a unified fashion with great confidence in our democracy. And I hope you picked up that we all share that and have that confidence in our democracy. So thanks, everybody, and we will see you in future uh, call, uh, webinars and calls. Bye-bye.